Okay, so today we'll be going over uh, seed tree uh, regeneration method. And so with seed tree, we're still in our regeneration treatment unit. Um, this is our second even aged silvicultural system. Um, and today what I wanna focus on a lot is the economics and the ecology. We talked a lot about those societal factors with clear cutting, but as you move into seed tree cuts, as you move into shelter woods and then two aged and uneven aged systems, a lot of those societal factors, you know, really become mitigated because you're not harvesting all the trees. So a lot of the issues that arise with clear cutting are because you're harvesting almost all the trees. So any of these other systems are going to help mitigate some of those issues. And so while we're talking about the seed tree system today, uh, much of what we'll be going over will be relevant to uh, the shelterwood system that we'll be talking about Tuesday in lecture. And so here's a photo of an example of a seed tree cut in slash pine where you can see the seed tree cut has been done on the left. Uh, the intact stand that has not been harvested, you can see that on the right there. Uh, but here's our definition for seed tree. So if you get seed tree uh, on a quiz, you definitely need to include that it's a regeneration method to produce an even age stand. So that's gonna be critical. <clears throat> Generally speaking, are we gonna plant in a seed tree? No, typically you're not thinking about planting in a seed tree because that new age class is gonna develop from seeds from those trees that you left there. That's the whole purpose of doing the seed tree. If you wanted to plant, you know, you're only trying to leave a very small number of trees breaker, you would just go out there and plant after a clear cut most likely. Um, and so where have you seen fully exposed micro environment before? Clear cut, right? You're trying to create the same light environment as a clear cut but you need just a few trees out there to drop seed, okay? Um, so here's the, the first silvicultural system we're getting into, where again, we're all very familiar and used to clear cuts, but here's a silvicultural system where a regeneration method is made up of multiple harvests. So it's easy for us to think of regeneration method and harvest as being synonymous, but here's a case where your regeneration method will actually occur over a three to five year period typically and include typically two harvests. One that removes everything but your seed trees, and then the second harvest, which goes back in and removes those seed trees. And so that's a, a little bit of a different wrinkle than what we're used to. And so here you see the cycle of that seed tree cut. And so you can see, you take the mature stand, you do the first cut, leaving a few seed trees per acre, and then that bottom right phase of stand development there that's labeled establishment, how many cohorts do you have there? You clearly have two, right? You have the older cohort and the, the new regenerating cohort beneath it. So that is a two age stand. So why is this an even age silvicultural system? Right, exactly, Britain. So you remove that older cohort. Again, we're talking about in Southern Pine, a three to five year period where you have two cohorts present on the site, but you may be on a 30 to 50 year rotation. So you're looking at 10% of the rotation or less being in this period where you have two cohorts out there. 90% of the rotation, it's an even age stand, which is why we consider this an even age method. That period where there's two cohorts present is temporary just to get the stand transition from the old stand to the new stand. And then most of the, the time period, you're in this tending phase of the rotation. Okay, so what I want you to do now, go ahead and split up into groups and I'll walk around here to help you out with any questions you may have. Uh, but let's think about a scenario where you have a landowner you're working with um, and this landowner has basically told you that they don't want to clear cut and plant. Um, they want to go you know, pretty low cost on their silviculture. They're okay, we, we saw all the comparisons between plantations and seed tree cuts last week. They're not trying to maximize financial gain. They, they want a good timber stand, they wanna make some money, but they want uh, that natural regeneration. And so here's some basic, very simple data on your stand. Uh, you've got 100 foot tall, mostly loblolly. So that's gonna look very similar to the stand we were out on on Tuesday in lab. QMB's 18 inches, so you know, think about the stand we were in at lab. It's gonna look a lot like that. Uh, relatively level terrain, you've got a moderate mid-story density, and you've got a relatively thick litter layer, so three inch thick. 
So what I want you to do in your group and, you know, try to stay six feet apart as you work and we've got, you know, the outside area here. Uh, but I want you to try and figure out, you're going to implement this on this landowner's property. Come up with how many seed trees you want to leave per acre. Um, and, you know, don't, don't get your phones out and get on the internet, or anything like that. Don't try to look it up. Try to just come up with a back of the envelope calculation for a reasonable guesstimate of how many trees you want to leave per acre. And you can use that data up there that you've got. So I'm not looking for one correct method. I'm not looking for you to look anything up. Just kind of see if you can come up with a creative solution uh, to give uh, us a reasonable estimate for how many trees per acre uh, you would want to leave. And so that's going to give you one number. Uh, when you've got your one number, go ahead and come up here and, and write it up on the little tiny whiteboard there. So any, any questions? Okay, let's go ahead and get started on that. Okay, um, so we can see all your different answers here. So we have five to seven, six, eight, 10, 10, nine, and then 12 trees per acre. So you guys all came up with a similar range of trees per acre. Uh, so what sort of math were you doing to arrive at this? <laughs> Just guessing, coming up with a number. Yes, yeah, so no one, no one used any equations for area, anything like that. Okay, so for 10 trees per acre, what you're saying is you're counting on each tree to be responsible for generating a tenth of an acre. Yeah, exactly right. And so if that tree is going to regenerate a tenth of an acre, you know, we, we know that an acre is 43,560 square feet per acre divided by 10. So that equals 4,356 um, trees or square feet that each tree is going to be regenerating. And so, um, as we're looking at that, how might you space those trees out? No, no further than height away from each other. So, no further. Okay, so you're saying put the trees 100 feet apart. Yeah, so if you put them on a 100 by 100 foot spacing, now we know each tree, what's 100 times 100? So, that's going to be 10,000, the one with four zeros after it. So. Here, so you've got, if you space them out 100 by 100 feet, by 100, then we know each tree gets 10,000 square feet. We also know there's 43,560 square feet per acre, so that's going to give you approximately what? It's going to be what, 4.3 TPA? If you go with that approach. And so you can see that would actually be a little bit lower uh, than any of you came up with here. Um, so that, that would be one approach where you can use geometry. You could just kind of come up with a reasonable guess. So um, we, we've got that as an option. And then let me show you an, another possible option here. And uh, some of you saw this in the reading. So let me share this here. Okay, and there we go. Um, so this is one example of some calculations that you could use. Um, and so you need to know a number of different things here um, in order to get the right number of trees per acre. And you saw some of the factors uh, that were listed up there um, on that last slide. So what were some of the important factors you were thinking about? So I heard something over here. So the height of the tree, we've just talked about that. The taller it is, the, more, the further it will disperse seed, right? Absolutely. What other factors that were on that previous slide were important? Topography becomes very important, right? Uh, if you're in a part of the country that's steep, you're gonna have a lot more difficulty dispersing seed uphill and it'll probably disperse further downhill, yeah? What other factors were on there that, comes, that come into play? Yeah, we had the thick litter layer so if, if you've got a thick litter layer like that, is that going to impact your number of seed trees you leave? What are you going to be thinking about with that thicker litter layer? Yeah, so we may want to burn, right? So sometimes adjusting the density of your seed trees uh, may be the right silvicultural treatment. Other times it may be a matter of we need another tool. So if you have a thick litter layer um, and you can get a prescribed fire out there, you know, maybe even a few years before you even think about doing the seed tree, that may help uh, produce more favorable seedbed conditions for that pine seed to hit bare mineral soil and germinate. So those are all going to be important. 
we saw on that last slide the QMD was 18 inches. And so is QMD going to be real important for this? So if you think about it, if you've got a tree, so let's compare two average diameters. If you have a stand where your average diameter tree is six inches versus 18 inches, think about what those two different trees look like, okay? So which one's gonna have the larger crown? The 18 inch DBH tree, all of the things being equal, is gonna have a much larger crown. And so it's gonna be significantly larger, right? So think about the varietal stand we were at at the Foshi property where our average diameter out there was starting to get close to six inches. Think about the crown size of those trees. Then think about lab this last week. Think about the crown size of those trees. It was much, much larger. So crown size, all of the things equal, is correlated to diameter. It's not a perfect relationship because we know we have different crown positions, but it's a good surrogate. And then our crown size is one of the best indicators we've got of seed production potential. Trees with bigger crowns have more leaves, they get more photosynthate, they're able to produce more sugar, they're able to reproduce more, produce more seed. They have larger crowns that can hold more fruits or more cones, depending on whether it's an angiosperm or gymnosperm. So that's a pretty good circuit. So that diameter, it's not immediately intuitive that, you know, oh, I need to know diameter to figure out how many trees I want to leave per acre in a seed tree but it really is gonna to correlate to that seed production potential uh, in many species. So there's a lot of different factors you wanna be aware of. Um, and you know, I, I was telling you in this exercise, just come up with your best answer, uh, but you, know, you, you can go to the literature and we do have a lot of valuable information in the literature. So you can look in the literature and this example was lava pond. we know a lot about it. So we know the typical seed dispersal distance is 200 to 300 feet. We know that the seed bed's unfavorable. We had that thick litter layer, but again, a prescribed burn if possible is gonna be our best option there. And so one procedure, when we were doing this math right here, you know, when we were saying 100 by 100 feet, what geometric shape were we thinking with this math? That was a square. That was just putting the trees out on a grid. And we can see this math is very simple. We already did that, that whole 20 minute video that y'all reviewed of how density and tree spraker are related, that's, how you take a square and figure out how many trees bigger. That's what this is. So we know that map, that map is relatively simple. And so a square would work where you could calculate the area per tree. Like in this example, you could use a circle. It's, it's completely flexible here. There's no one necessarily right or wrong answer. But then the other thing we wanna think again, if you saw that 100 by 100 foot square and it came in at four trees per acre, you all picked higher densities. So you all decided on some higher densities there. So that may be to build in some sort of safety factor where if you lose a tree or two from those seed trees you've left, you're still okay. Uh, you still get enough seed out on that site. And those safety factors, that, that's completely the art of silviculture. There, there's no science to that. Uh, that's just take, us taking a wild guess uh, based on our experience. Convert it all to a density. So here's an example where we use a circle. So because the formula for a circle is slightly more complex than the formula for a square, you know, the math is ever so slightly more complex, but there's that same 100 feet plugging in, just using the height of the tree. And so we know the seed will disperse two to 300 feet, but we've already dropped it down to 100 feet. So that's already built in a safety factor of two to three, where we may have more trees out there than we necessarily need. And when you take pi and multiply it by 10,000, which is 100 times 100, uh, what that gives you is 31,416 square feet per tree. And that would be where the seed could disperse. So that would be projecting pretty level topography without a prevailing wind direction. So you'd have the notion that the tree was dispersing all around it. And so that's basically giving us um, 1.4 trees per acre, okay? If you have 1.4 trees per acre, each tree provides seed to 31,000 square feet, that, that's gonna cover your whole acre. And then you could build in another safety factor here. That number three is completely arbitrary. Okay, if, if you thought this site was going to be really hard to seed in, so maybe you have unfavorable litter conditions or you know you just have a soil where you're going to need a lot of seed because you're expecting a lot of mortality. Maybe you have a real drought prone sand, something like that, and you want to get a lot of seed out there, bump it to four, bump it to five. If you're on top of a ridge and you think, you know, there's a good chance a number of these trees will be struck by lightning, that's going to be really hard to predict, but you could bump that up if you want. Um, so no one firm right answer there, but that again gets us to a similar idea to 
a lot of the numbers that you all came up with. And, you know, the only consequences between going between five and 10, which is kind of our range here, um, you know, you, you are leaving those large trees out there for an extra period of three to five years. So you're deferring some value, but at the same time, you're growing those trees really fast once you leave them, assuming you don't lose them. And so when you do harvest them in three to five years, they'll be worth even more typically. So uh, there, there's some trade-offs there, but it depends on all these factors. And we've already talked about all these species of tree. Uh, so if, if we think about our Southern pines, so we've got shortleaf pine, lava leaf pine, longleaf pine, for example, okay? Which one of those is gonna have seed that disperses the shortest distances? Shortleaf, lava leaf, or longleaf? Yeah, so longleaf, it's got the heaviest seed. So the wind, you, you need a higher velocity wind to blow that seed the same distance as a smaller, lighter seed. So shortleaf will probably disperse the furthest. It's the smallest seeded. Longleaf will probably disperse the shortest. Lava olive should be intermediate. So the species matters, okay? That seed dispersal distance varies based on seed characteristics. We've already talked about the size of the trees, both the height and the diameter. That's gonna make a difference, but also that size of the crown. So you can start thinking about live crown ratio. Does the live crown occupy 20% of the tree's total height, 40%? That's gonna influence the overall seed production potential. And then we talked about topography, wind direction. We haven't talked about the periodicity of seed crop. Okay, that's another thing to think about. So lava olive pine, how often does it produce seed? We went over this the very first day of Denver. I'm sure everyone's thinking about that, right? Every one or two years. Yeah, every one or two years. It produces seed in most years. Okay, has pretty decent seed crops in most years. So when you do a seed tree operation with lava olive pine, are you reasonably confident that it's going to work? Yeah, yeah, there's a reasonable assumption that you've got a good shot at getting it to work because whatever the year is, you're probably going to get enough seed to make it to work. Okay, what about longleaf pine? Sally's shaking her head no. We know it's producing seed. It's coning and producing seed every five, six, seven years on average. So if you go and just do this in a random year, that means more likely than not, you did that in a year when it's not going to produce much seed. Okay, so it may not work, but that's another advantage of seed tree. What can you do if it doesn't work that year? You can leave the seed trees out there, right? You can continue to leave the seed trees until you do get that good seed year. Of course, the longer you leave them, you know, that, that's, you know, like leaving a field fallow, right? You're not producing much on that acre of land. So there's an opportunity cost there. And then on top of that, um, just because you don't have longleaf pine seed on that site, what, what's gonna happen without that longleaf pine seed? Something else is gonna grow there. So you may need to continue to burn that site periodically um, or spray with herbicides uh, in order to ensure that whenever you do get that good seed year, that you will have favorable conditions for those seeds to germinate. So those are all things you need to consider. Um, so lots of different things that go into this. Here's an example. Um, I, I took this photo up in Arkansas on Dr. Kidd's hardwood silviculture field tour. Um, while it was a hardwood tour, we did see plenty of shortleaf pine. And so there the Forest Service had done the shortleaf pine seed tree, uh, but you can see uh, that you had a little bit of blow down there. So one of them had blown over. So uh, there's an example of a loss of a seed tree, but as you look at that site, it's gonna be just fine. Okay, there's no issue there. Uh, the Forest Service in this case was actually underplanting this with seedlings, which you don't typically think about with seed trees. But there was kind of an interesting societal factor going on here. Uh, so last class we talked about the National Forest Management Act, about how these national forests have these 50-year plans. This was a very productive area on this national forest up in Arkansas. So uh, this area, timber was the chief objective. They knew they had high site indices, could produce nice, nice timber. But in that forest plan, they had provisions where that they didn't want to clear cut. So they had gone through this process, building public consensus, and that basically meant that there were some restrictions in their plan on clear cutting. So instead, they did a seed tree cut here so that they wouldn't violate the provisions of that management plan. Uh, despite doing a seed tree cut here, they knew that if they planted short leaf out here, they would probably be more likely to successfully regenerate that site because of the planted seedlings. And they also knew that they would be able to take advantage of uh, you know, 
tree improvement programs and maybe put some improved short leaf pine out there. Whereas the seed that drops is just gonna be, um, you know, these trees would have been 70 plus years old probably. And so it's gonna be, you know, whatever pine they were able to regenerate on that site back in 1950 or so. Um, so there's an example where, you know, that's not the textbook use of a seed tree, but they had a specific management situation. They had all the tools in their silvicultural toolbox and they came up with a solution that worked in this particular case. So you don't always have to follow just that strict textbook approach. You've got the tools, you know, come up with something that's going to work. If all you have is a hammer and screws, you can still put something together, right? Um, it just may be a little awkward. Okay, uh, we've got the literature here. Um, and so this table has been reproduced in the useful handouts packet. And so there we have recommendations on our uh, different sized pines. So you've got different DBHs, how many to leave per acre for long leaf, short leaf, and slash. Uh, you don't see long leaf up there. I'll get into that in just a moment. But if we think about it here, um, so five to seven trees per acre, 10 trees per acre, 12 trees per acre with a frowning face, okay? When you pick these different densities, if I handed you a can of paint and I turned you loose on that forest we were in uh, on Tuesday, and I said, go mark 12 seed trees to leave per acre, what would you physically go out and do? So you go start painting trees. How do you know you're getting 12 per acre? That's my question. So if I actually told each of you to do this and then turn you loose on a different acre of land, and then we came back and you don't have that acre delineated, you, you know, you're just out in the woods, you're out in the woods. So you're eyeballing everything. And we came back and we measured it. How many different actual densities of seed trees do you think y'all would have marked as a group? I'm betting it would be a nice normal distribution. <laughs> there'd be a few one tree per acres, maybe there'd be a few 20 trees per acre. And there'd be a lot of you that would be in the middle closer to the target, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think we would do a very consistent job, right? So if you're putting that paint can in someone's hand and telling them, I want 12 seed trees per acre, as a forester, you've walked in the woods, what's gonna be an easy way to implement that? What, what are you actually looking at in the woods? When you're out there trying to figure out a density, what are you actually looking at? How are you trying to estimate that visually? So when you go and you timber cruise and you put in your plots on a grid, how do you ensure that you have the right grid out there for your timber cruise? So if you want to put your plots out, you say maybe putting them out on a 10 by five chain grid. Okay. How are you out in the woods actually ensuring that your plots are going out on that 10 by five chain grid? What are you doing? So I see some hand motions. So a prism is just gonna help you estimate how many trees are in a point, but it's not gonna tell you where to put the points. So what do you wanna do anytime you wanna sample on a fixed grid? What do you need to know? So what's that? What, what'd you say, Katie? Yeah, you count while you walk, right? You count your pace, okay? So when you count your pace, you're just estimating the distance between plots, okay? Um, and you know, once you work in the woods a lot doing this, you get very good keeping track of your pace, your direction, and so you get a reasonably accurate grid like you intended uh, to put these plots in. It's the same idea here. So if I told us all put in 12 trees per acre, that's, a, that's kind of abstract, right? Um, we may have never seen a stand that had exactly 12 trees per acre, right? But if I tell you, see the numbers in parentheses there? If I tell you, space your seed trees out every 60 feet. Now that's a much more concrete thing. We can go out and I've painted my mark on this tree that I wanna leave. Let me pace 60 feet and look for another tree about in that area that'll work. Let me pace 60 feet, go down a line, pace over 60 feet, come back. And you could serpentine through the stand, putting your trees out on an approximate grid uh, 60 foot by 60 foot spacing, which is going to yield 12 trees per acre. So knowing the spacing, now we can go actually implement that. Just telling someone a number of trees per acre, that, that may be harder. That's going to take more of an eye. Now, sometimes with some of these variables like trees per acre and basal area, uh, you can, through experience, get good at estimating that by looking at a stand. 
So typically when we first thin pine plantations, uh, the loggers that are doing that, that are working in the feller, they don't have the stand mark. They're not told how many trees to take down. They're often given a target basal area. The forester will go in behind them and put in plots and sample and see, you know, if their target basal area is 70, they'll start putting in plots and they'll say, ah, it's 65 in a lot of these areas. They'll go talk to the logger and say, you're taking a little bit too much, maybe, you know, leave a little bit more um, and they'll get that adjusted. But that person operating that feller can get pretty good at eyeballing what a basal area is. But that takes experience. So um, if you're first starting out with this or you're just trying to get consistency across a larger crew, uh, working with spacing will really help you out a lot there. Okay, so I didn't mention longleaf. And that's because longleaf only produces cones every five to seven years. It produces irregular seed crops. Um, so if we continue to do face-to-face -face labs, we'll get a chance to actually apply this in a few weeks. Uh, where what you would do in longleaf is if you want to leave a, a seed tree cut in for longleaf, you want to make sure you get enough seed per acre. So one, you want to make sure the cones are there. So you basically go out, you borrow Alana's birding binoculars, and you put them to real use, and you look at pine cones with them. And so you just count the pine cones on each tree, um, and from that, you can develop an estimate of how much seed will be out on that site, which will tell you, is this a good year or not to regenerate? And so we know from the literature, I've got data up there for lot lolly and shortleaf as well, but generally they produce seed in enough years, you don't worry about this with them. And thank goodness, because counting shortleaf cones, that would be pretty tedious. There's a lot of them and they're small. You don't want to do that. Uh, longleaf cones are large and there's fewer of them, so still not ideal, but better. Uh, so we know to get good regeneration, to get enough trees per acre, we want 50,000 longleaf pine seeds per acre. We don't necessarily want 50,000 trees, but we know these are large seeds. They're subject to hybridation. Not all of them will germinate. And so that's our seed target that we know from the literature should give us enough trees per acre. Okay, so you want to know how many seeds per cone there are. Okay, and the cones are, you know, 60 feet up in a tree, 80 feet up in a tree. So how do you know how many seeds per cone there are? So what you need to do is you need to go get a, a sophisticated piece of equipment uh, called a cone and foliage sampler. Um, it'll often come in a variety of different gauges. And then you basically, you go shoot cones out of the trees. Um, so you go out there and you shoot cones out of the trees um, and you can choose the number of trees you sample and the number of cones you sample based on your statistical objectives. Just like in timber cruising, you would come up with a cruise precision it's based on the variation you're observing out in your stand. Uh, you could do that for this. So you shoot down some cones, you cut them apart, you count the seeds in a, a small number of cones, 30 cones, 50 cones, something like that. You don't wanna make it too much work. And that gives you an estimate. It might be 50 seeds per cone. You might find less on some stands, more on some stands. That's a ballpark. Then you stand there with the binoculars. You go about a tree height away from the tree, just like you would to estimate its height. And you stay put, you don't you know, move around, bob and weave, anything like that. And you just use your binoculars and you count the cones. And what you're trying to count is those green closed cones, okay? Why aren't you counting the brown open cones? They've already dropped their seed, okay? And you're less likely to see that in longleaf because that cone would have had to be there from typically five, six, seven years ago. So usually in longleaf, when you go out there, you'll get a year where you have these green one-year-old cones, and then the next year, those are gonna open and drop seed. So you wanna go out there in you know, April, that sort of time period, typically, uh, where you're gonna be able to see these cones. And what you're trying to predict is, should I try to get the seed tree cut done, hopefully you know, over the summer is sort of the idea. Um, and then once you have all that, you can figure out how many cones per acre you have, and you can figure out how many trees per acre will produce all that seed. Uh, so what I want you to do next, so let's, let's figure out how this math works, and I've shown it to you up there. And so you can see these equations are just ratios of one, where the different variables are all going to cancel out. Cones cancel out with cones, seeds cancels out with seeds, and that ends up leaving you trees per acre. So if you plug in everything and you calculate trees per acre on the top, okay, that'll tell you how many trees per acre you, you get based on that scenario. But then if you use that equation at the bottom, you take those trees per acre you've got, multiply it by cones per tree, multiply it by seeds per cone, that should give you a number pretty close to 50,000. That's the same equation, just reorganized algebraically. 
And so they're not two different equations. There's the same equation shown two different ways, but you can see, you can either go from, okay, I've done my cone counting. How many trees per acre do I need to leave in this seed tree to actually give me 50,000 seeds per acre? Or you could do all this and say, I want to leave 10 trees per acre. How many seeds is that going to leave me? And you could calculate that on the bottom and you could get 10,000 seeds per acre. And, yeah, that's too low. I don't want to risk that. So, uh, so you could do it two different ways, but it's really the same process. Um, so go ahead and uh, split up into your groups. You've got all the assumptions up there. Let's go ahead and use an average year with 35 seeds per cone. Let's go ahead and assume we want 50,000 seeds per acre. So what else do you need to know? You need to know how many cones you counted per tree, okay? So let's say you counted 20 cones per tree, but there's one more trick you need to be aware of, and this will be really important if you get a question like this on a quiz. When you're standing there in one spot looking at all these cones through binocular, are you gonna see them all? You're gonna miss a fair number of them. There's some you're just gonna miss. There's some that are hidden. There's some all on the backside of the tree. We know that. So we have a uh, very easy workaround. You take how many cones you count, you double, okay? You need to double. So if I say you counted 20 cones, make sure you double it and we're predicting there are actually 40 cones on that tree. Uh, so you all can go ahead and work in groups on this. Um, and once you've got an answer, you can go ahead and come put it up on the board. Okay, um, so you can see here, uh, you guys all came up with about 36 trees per acre. There may be a little bit of difference due to rounding. And so the math here is pretty straightforward. Um, the equation looks complicated because it has all the units built in there. But here it's simply the 50,000 seeds per acre divided by the 20 cones we counted, and you always double that. And then you multiply that by the seeds per cone, 35. So that's how you would write it out as simply as possible in one equation. Um, and sure enough, that equals the 35.7, which we can just round up to 36 trees per acre. So you guys all did the math right. The most common mistake that I see on uh, these calculations is pretty straightforward. You simply forget to double the cone count. So if you forget to double the cone count, what's that do to your answer if I raise the two out of the denominator here? It would double, okay? So you would end up with some estimate of about 71 trees per acre, okay? So that's the most common mistake I see on this. So just make sure you remember to double that actual cone count. Okay, um, so we got the answer there of our uh, 36 trees per acre, 35 trees per acre. So based on that, should you do a seed tree cut in this long length pine stand this year? What do you think? So just to give you a frame of reference, that stand we were out on in lab on Tuesday probably had about 35 trees per acre. That would be a reasonable estimate of density in that stand. Did you see many seedlings in that stand? And that was loblolly we were looking at. Which is more shade intolerant, loblolly or longleaf? Longleaf is more shade intolerant, okay? So if you cut a stand down to that density in longleaf, are you gonna get good regeneration? No. So basically, by only counting 20 trees per acre, sorry, only counting 20 cones per acre, where we're only estimating 40 cones per tree, you have some cones that year, but what you're predicting is that's not the best cone year. So you probably want to wait uh, because you need to leave too many trees per acre. So with longleaf, you always have this sort of tension when you're trying to do a seed tree. Your intent is to leave a fully exposed microenvironment because you know that longleaf is very intolerant of shade. But longleaf often doesn't produce enough seed to allow you to do that in many years. So you're often leaving something that looks somewhere between a seed tree and a shelter wood, and you're kind of coming up with a compromise on, I need the seed, I also need the light on the forest floor, let's just come up with a comfortable middle ground, do the best we can, um, and hope it works. Uh, and if it doesn't, what's your backup plan? You can plant trees, okay? You can buy longleaf seedlings, you can plant longleaf seedlings if it fits within your financial constraints. So, um, so that, that may be an option there for you as well. Okay, uh, so that's a little bit on cone counting and we'll do this exercise again in a lab. 
Normally the lab would be this week or next, but we're a little behind uh, this semester. So, um, so there I put a different problem up for you with 18 cones. You can see we come up with very similar numbers. So. Okay, uh, let's look at a few more examples of seed trees. So just to give you sort of a feel for what these seed tree operations may look like and to sort of start thinking about how is a seed tree cut going to be different than a clear cut and plant operation and how's that influence your prescription writing and think back again when we talked about plantations out that hill farm example where we saw the seed tree data at age 15 and the pine plantation data at age 15. so be thinking about that exercise as well because we've already talked about this a little bit and so this is what a loblolly pine seed tree cut is going to look like where they've left only nine trees per acre that's only 12 square feet of basal area per acre uh, when the trees were 16 inches diameter. So you can see why we're describing this as a fully exposed microenvironment. okay? Um, would you like to go out there in an afternoon in July and we'll stand there and talk for an hour in lab? No, <laughs> that would be hot, right? You're gonna be getting a lot of sun in there. Okay, this is an example of a successful seed tree operation on the Sabine National Forest, not far from here to our east. Um, and you can see they cut down to a number of seed trees there and you have a dense cohort of new regeneration coming in, okay? So look at that cohort of new pine trees there coming in and think about that compared to a plantation where you may be planting trees on a 10 by 10 foot spacing as an example. That's a much higher density. When seed tree systems work well, your establishment density may be very high. It may be 1,000 trees per acre, it may be 10,000 trees per acre, it may be 50,000 trees per acre. So you end up with these extremely high establishment densities. And that's really what's gonna influence everything that happens afterwards, okay? So that really high density at establishment, what's that gonna do to you in stem exclusion? Lots of mortality, okay? So if you have 10,000 stems per acre, by the end of a rotation, you're hoping for maybe 100, 125, somewhere in that range. So you need 90% mortality. So how long is stem exclusion going to take? It's going to take a lot longer. So the period of stem exclusion is going to become protracted compared to a plantation planted at 400 trees per acre. Now we can move through stem exclusion very quickly because we've already artificially spaced that stand up to skip, if you want to think about it this way, to skip the early phases of stem exclusion by planting in a wide spacing and using herbicides uh, to control that spacing. Okay, this is a lopoli pine stand that was regenerated by a seed tree cut. And so as we look at this stand, what are some differences between that and a, and a pine plantation at the same age that you may notice? There's a lot of hardwood, right? And so you could spray with chemicals in a seed tree, often you don't. Um, so you end up with more hardwood. It's more of a mixed stand, less of a pure stand. So we talked about diameter distributions. If you're drawing the diameter distribution for this stand, so you've got, we know it's an even age stand. So we know it's gonna be that normal distribution, that single bell-shaped curve. But is that bell-shaped curve going to be narrow and real pointed? Is it going to be wide and real flat? What kind of hump is it going to be? It's going to be wide and real flat. And what that means is lots of variability, okay? We see some really big trees, we see some really small trees, and we see everything in between. So your uniformity goes down in general. You have more variability out there. Is that going to make a logging operation simpler or more complex? more complex okay so it's a more complex operation to log uh, you may have more sorts at the log deck um, and so it's just building a little bit more complexity in there looking at this stand just from that photo how old do you think this stand is so throw out some numbers what's your guess 2018 so those are pretty reasonable estimates it turns out this particular stand uh, it's 25 years old, but you have to keep in mind that a seed tree plantation, or not plantation, a seed tree stand is going to move through stem exclusion slower. So when we get in this plantation mindset, you have to slow everything down for a seed tree cut. Uh, you're not going to be thinning at age 12 commercially. 
you're not going to be selling at age 15, 16, 17, commercially most likely, and you're probably not going to have a 25 year rotation. So you need to extend your rotation. You need to wait longer till you get to the first commercial thing. Um, and you're not going to be doing everything as quickly. And it's all driven by density. Density is driving the vast majority of that. Uh, here's an example up on the Wachita National Forest in Oklahoma in shortleaf pine. Uh, there you see 15 trees per acre and a 14 inch average diameter. Uh, and they uh, left 16 square feet per acre of basal area. So as we look at that, did they do a good job selecting their seed trees? So what do you want to think about when you're selecting your seed trees? Four, okay, why? You want the best trees and why do you want the best trees? Yeah, those are the parents of your next cohort, okay? So those are gonna be the mother trees and a lot of the pollen's coming from there. Remember our pines are monoecious. So those are gonna be mostly the father trees for your next cohort. And then I saw Sally up here doing this. So if you leave the best form trees, your next rotation will have hopefully better form trees because of better genetics. And then if timber's your objective, you're making more money. So how'd they do? I've seen a thumbs down back there from Alejandro. So uh, what, what's the, your specific problem with their choices here? Is it everything they left there? Some of them look a little bit small, but if those are the biggest trees on your stand, you know, those are the biggest trees on your stand, right? Uh, you may be in areas in some parts of the world where site index is just pretty low. Uh, so you know you're on a longer rotation because site index is low. So if we look at these trees, see if I can get the mouse over here where I can see it. How about that one right there? Is that a good one? No. So that's not the best form tree. And when we answered that immediately said, no, not the best form tree. What did we all assume? We all made an assumption. So we assumed it's a pine, it is a pine. But what's the assumption we all made when we said no? We all made the exact same assumption. The assumption we made was that we're managing for timber. So we all assumed we're managing for timber and because we're managing for timber, that's not the ideal timber form for a tree. Uh, but in this particular case, it's on national forest. And we know our national forest timber is one objective among the others listed in the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act. So there's one they left for wildlife. It's linear, it's got large limbs. So you've got more physical habitat structure up in that canopy. Um, and that has a larger crown than any of the other trees out there. So its seed production potential is the highest. So it's producing more mast. Uh, you can have more squirrels with more, you know, seed to eat up there. So they left it for wildlife. So it was an intentional choice. Uh, but if, if we were true to our assumption, if the number one and only objective on this stand was timber, then absolutely that, that wouldn't have been the ideal tree to leave. So, so you always have to think about your objective. Um, here's an example uh, that I, I took out in Oregon a few years ago. This was Douglas fir, where they had left a seed tree. And they leave seed trees because they have a lot of issues with aesthetics. So many of the large companies aren't doing this, uh, but this particular example uh, was on uh, either state forest or forest that was managed by the forestry school out there at Oregon State University. And so aesthetics are a big deal. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people out in this area that like to recreate out in the woods and they have mountainous terrain so you can see these areas from far away. So one practice that they've gone to is they often leave seed tree cuts in Douglas fir. And this can be challenging for a few reasons. So we were talking and we're used to our eastern examples where we have lava like pine, it's 100 feet tall. Okay. Well, here they've got Douglas fir that could easily be 200 feet tall. Okay. So if you think about that 200 foot tall tree, you know, you can't leave very many per acre without them putting a lot of shade out there just because they're so tall. And so there, you know, they've left a fair number of them. Those trees are not 200 feet tall. Those trees were more in the 70 foot tall range. But, um, but you know, you've got that height which produces a lot of shade. And then you can see there's a lot of vegetation in the understory. Uh, they have an invasive Himalayan blackberry so, you know, we complain about our invasive species here, but at least they don't have prickles on them. Uh, so those, those things are a nightmare. Uh, so th there are a number of issues there. And so basically they want to leave the seed tree for aesthetics, 
but they don't trust the seed tree to do a good job regenerating their stand. Uh, they've been burned too many times. It hasn't worked. And so they leave the seed tree, but they tend to underplant them. Um, and Douglas fir is a tree that's more towards the intermediate spectrum of shade tolerance. And so uh, that's, that's a workable solution. So, so there's another example where, again, you've got all these tools. What you actually do in the field doesn't have to be a textbook definition if it works in your particular situation. Okay, here's shortleaf pine. Um, and it's hard to see from that photo. It's getting brighter here in this room, so the projector is not working as well. But basically, there's no seedlings in the understory. You can write the perfect prescription on a piece of paper. You think about everything. You consider every factor. You come up with the, you know, just perfect prescription. But then you go out there after those seed trees have been out there for a year or two or three, and you look around and no seedlings, no younger cohort, okay? So it's not always going to work for you. Sometimes it's going to fail. We know that. Uh, so there is an advantage to the seed tree cut here. You've gone out there, the shortly pine seed tree has failed. You have no regeneration in the understory. What can you do? What do you do next on this stand? You can still wait it out. You could still wait it out, okay. So you could say maybe it's gonna happen, it just hasn't happened yet. Cross your fingers and wait another year, wait another two years. Um, what could you do to maybe increase your odds of it working? Yeah, you could open up more growing space in that understory. So you could include a prescribed fire. Uh, you could, you know, spray with an herbicide uh, to again, allow more growing space for new cohorts should you get that seed. Um, so those, those are both options. You do have to be a little bit careful with that. Sometimes the seedlings are there and you don't even realize it. Um, so if you put an herbicide out there that's gonna kill longleaf pines, or sorry, shortleaf pine seedlings, uh, you may have done yourself a disservice but if you put a prescribed fire out there, what do we know about shortleaf pine seedlings and surface fires? They can re-sprout, okay? So if the fire is not too severe, if it doesn't completely kill them, they have that root crook and they can re-sprout. Um, so, you know, a fire may be in, you know, in this particular case, something where it could control some competing vegetation. Uh, if it works right, it could top kill seedlings that you have out there but the root system is still there. And so that root system is storing carbohydrates. It's a few years old maybe, and it's ready to go with a re-sprout, which will then grow rapidly. Um, so that may be a way where you can break any existing regeneration that's there that maybe you missed out, as well as freeing up some of that competing growing space. And of course, you know, you always have the option if the financial situation is such that it's possible, you could go in, you could remove those short leaf pines, you could go to more intensive silviculture. You could plant shortleaf pine out there. Uh, so we can buy containerized shortleaf pine seedlings. We can buy bare root shortleaf pine seedlings. We can plant them. So, so that, that's an advantage of shortleaf. If, if it does, or sorry, that's an advantage of the seed tree approach. If it doesn't work perfectly, it does leave you more options than if you had clear cut and it failed. So, so if we start thinking about the rest of the rotation. Again, if it works right, you may end up with a stand like that on the right with slash pine, okay? I've seen stands of loblolly pine regenerated with a seed tree that had so many trees per acre, and these are only trees you know, about, about as big around as your thumb up to an inch in diameter, that you literally have to lower your shoulder and push trees over just to move through the stand. There's no open growing space. These things are on like a six inch by six inch spacing. Um, so it's just at an incredible density. And when you end up with that high a density, these trees, each tree is just a tiny little stick with a few needles on top. Uh, there's not much wiggle room for each tree. They're not getting many site resources. So at extreme densities, your height growth can become very slow at those really high densities. And if you end up with a disturbance like a drought, or imagine what happens if any amount of fire makes it into this stand? <laughs> it is gone, okay? I've seen stands like this where fire has gotten in there and it's killed all the trees, but inconveniently it hasn't burned them all down. And so we were out at field station one year and there's someone on a big dozer just dozing this to the ground. Um, all the trees are black and all the trees are dead, but it didn't actually burn all the wood. So their best solution was let's just bulldoze this thing to the ground. Uh, there were too many trees to use any sort of felling equipment, just push them over, 
and plant again is all you can really do. So when you end up with those extremely high densities, you need to think about some sort of thing. But we know we don't have any forest products out there yet. It's going to be a pre-commercial thing. So there you might put in what we call a corridor thing. So can you row thin a stand regenerated with the seed tree regen method? You can't row thin it because there are no rows because you didn't plant trees. The seed fell where it fell and there are no rows. But you can do the same concept where you go out into the stand and if you have a small dozer and maybe it's got a blade on it that's eight feet wide, you can drive it right down here and you can create a corridor where you just basically kill and flatten all the trees in that eight foot wide corridor. Then maybe you go over another eight feet and you do the same thing again. And you could go and you could just basically doze down half the stand. And what's gonna happen then, the trees that are on the edge of those now open corridors, they're the winners. They're gonna take off, half of them is getting good light. They've got all that area they can root into now, get water and nutrients. They're gonna take off the trees, you know, four foot into a corridor right in the middle those trees are gonna lose, okay? They're gonna be suppressed, they're gonna die off. But because you've moved it into that period of canopy differentiation much quicker, and you've cut the stocking of that site down by half in that example, you're gonna accelerate stem exclusion, you're gonna shorten your rotation, you're gonna to get to your first commercial thin much sooner, and your stand is gonna be much more resistant to many different types of disturbance. And so a pre-commercial thin on a stand like this you have to think of it as an investment. You're spending money now, you're not making money when you do that, but it's gonna make everything after that for the rest of the rotation more valuable and sooner. And so it may be the most valuable single treatment you do over the whole rotation, even though it's not yielding an immediate economic return. So pre-commercial thinning can be real important. You could do it in other ways. If those trees are, more, more, are small like that, you could send out a crew with machetes and they can knock trees down by hand pretty easily. You can send tree, uh, crews out with brush saws. I think there was a video for those of you that did online field station this past summer, where it's basically a, a weed whacker, but instead of having the nylon string on the end, it's got like a circular saw blade. Um, so they, they run through the woods and cut lots of trees down with those. So lots of different options. You could even think of different herbicide options to implement a pre-commercial thin. Um, they'll actually do pre-commercial thins on pine plantations commonly uh, throughout our region. Because often what happens is you put in a pine plantation and it's right beside a big mature stand and that mature stand drops a whole bunch of seed and you planted 600 trees per acre, but then another thousand seeded in. So they go in there and they try to remove those other thousand by one of these methods uh, to get the stand back down to a healthier density. And so this is an example, uh, again, off one of uh, Dr. Kidd's hardwood silviculture field tours up in the Ozark National Forest. Uh, this was a short leaf pine stand that they had pre-commercially thinned with herbicides. They had used herbicides to do this. So they don't herbicide many acres per year, but this was one example. Um, and you can see now that stand, it, it would have been at a density like that photo you just saw. Now this stand looks like it's at a density much more similar to what we might plant. And so now this stand is gonna move through stand development much more quickly, okay? Uh, you've short circuited or shortcut stem exclusion. Okay, uh, so we're thinking about how we're managing that younger cohort, but at some point we're gonna need to remove the trees we left. We've gotta take the seed trees out. So uh, seed tree system is not appropriate for oaks. Uh, shelter woods would be appropriate for oaks, but I threw those on here anyway, because there's a lot of overlap between what we think about in a seed tree and a shelter wood. And so, you know, if it were oaks and a shelter wood, you want 400 to 600 well-distributed saplings, you want them at least DBH height, you want them to have a DBH. Longleaf pine, we want 6,000 per acre, okay? Longleaf's usually pretty variable, okay? They break out of the grass stage at different times, uh, and that influences height growth rates. So you want a lot of them. You know, again, by the end of the rotation, you probably want about 100 of them or less. And so, you know, you're thinking of moving them through stem exclusion. So three to six years in longleaf, out west, you want them a foot and a half to two feet tall on many of those different conifers, uh, but you don't want them too tall uh, because they become more susceptible to being broken or damaged when they go and remove the seed trees. So there's kind of a sweet spot there. And out west, depending on where you are, who knows, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 
you know, they may be on much longer rotations in areas getting 16, 20 inches of rain a year. So the, the timing is really going to be pretty variable depending on the climate. And then there's the question, right? You're sending logging equipment back out there. We, we looked at fellers, we looked at skitters, you know, last class. So you're sending all that out there. What's going to happen to all those new little baby trees you just got growing, right? You're going to run a bunch of them over. We know that. Uh, when you go out to get those seed trees, you're going to run them over, then you're going to drop the big mother, mother tree on them, and then you're going to go drag that through the stand. So you're going to do a lot of damage to your new cohort. But we've anticipated that, and so if you start looking at the data, and this is just as applicable to a shelter wood, really more applicable to a shelter wood, because in a shelter wood, you've left way more trees in the overstory, so you're going to do even more damage when you move. Um, but when we look at data from northern hardwoods in the northeast and the lake states, skid trails on a harvest only occupy 16% of the land area. So we're only actually driving over with the skidders about one seventh of our acreage. Okay, haul roads are only 1%. So we're operating on less of the area of a stand than we really think we would be. So that's good news. Um, in Norway, looking at Norway spruce, which is another of these conifers that can regenerate at 50,000 trees per acre, they found that they killed basically between a third and two thirds of them uh, when they did a shelter wood there, but then they went back and all was well, fully stock stamped. So you wouldn't think about that, you know, killing two thirds of your trees and it being okay, but if you have 6,000 longleaf per acre, you may be able to do that. We looked last class at some of these steeper slopes where they may be managing species like Douglas fir and Sitka spruce, and they may need to do cable logging. What they found in many of those systems is that the area where the cables run up and down the hill are heavily impacted. So removing the seed trees there and dragging them back up the hill pretty much takes out all your regeneration in that area. But the rest of that hill slope is okay. So what they did in that situation is they would just go down the areas where the cables had been, and they would go and they would plant seedlings there to regenerate those areas, but that was a relatively small percentage of their overall stand. So again, we can fix this with tree planting if we need it. You've got to get the tree planting in pretty quick, though, so that everything's about the same age. Otherwise, you're wasting time with those planted seedlings because they may get overtopped and, you know, there's no reason to put them out there then. So think about longleaf. If our target is 3,000 to 6,000 trees per acre, but even if you want to get a thousand of them, you know, 15 feet tall, which is still a lot of trees, that means you can kill almost all of them and it's still fine. You can kill between two thirds and 83%. So, so we know we're going to damage regen, but if you get enough regen out there to start with, think about it this way. We just talked about pre-commercial thinning, right? Where I described one way that you could do it is a corridor thin where you run a dozer back and forth, but what's on the front of a skitter? You've got a blade, a little dozer blade on the front of a skitter. So you're going out there with a logging crew and you're bothering to get that heavy equipment on the ground to remove those seed trees. That may be a good opportunity where when they're out there, you say, go get those seed trees. And also if you could, you know, doze down a few of these in a specific pattern, you've done your seed tree removal and you've pre-commercially thinned the stand in one operation, okay? So you can build some efficiencies in there where you don't then wait five years or whatever and get another dozer crew out there with the, that expense and everything. So, so there, there's some synergies there potentially uh, with how you can build these prescriptions. Okay, so any questions on seed trees?